that teasing ragged is a daisy It's got everybody crazy I bet that you never will feel lazy When you hear that teasing rag It's full of life and start to finish Minor and diminish I bet that I can see your finish When you hear that teasing rag Oh, how sweet that music sounds Music is universal. Styles may change with time and place, but human beings have always had a need to create music for personal expression, for entertainment, for communication, and as a reflection of the world around us. Music, therefore, can serve as a lens through which to explore our history. What type of music did people make when and why? What was life like for those making the music or for those who were listening? This presentation will share just a few stories of black musicians from Tacoma's past who left an important legacy in our city. Some of these musicians made Tacoma their home, while others were only guests here for a short time. Each of these people added to the artistic vitality of our community, while also confronting the realities of discrimination based on the color of their skin. Thank you for joining us for this journey back in time with the help of historic photographs and video and audio which is both old and new. On behalf of Tacoma Historical Society and Tacoma Public Library, it is a pleasure to bring these stories to you. Nettie Craig was born in Leavenworth, Kansas on July 15, 1865. She was the youngest of six children of Violet Craig and the only sibling born free. Nettie's father was William Wallingford, the owner of the plantation on which Violet was a slave. Nettie was a precocious child. She began studying the piano at the age of eight and before long was composing her own music. Few women of any race attended college in this era. Breaking that barrier, Nettie would go on to earn not just an undergraduate degree, but also a Ph.D., which she received from the Kansas Conservatory of Music and Elocution on June 12, 1883. She is believed to be the first African-American woman in the United States to receive a doctoral degree. Nettie moved to Seattle in 1890 with her first husband, Albert Jones. She became the first organist and musical director in the newly established First African Methodist Episcopal Church. After Albert's untimely death in 1893, Nettie moved back to Kansas to be with her family. But it wasn't long before they would return to the Northwest, this time settling in Tacoma. Here she met Henry Joseph Asbury, whom she married in 1895. The couple would prosper in Tacoma. Henry was a well-known businessman and the proprietor of the Tacoma Hotel Barbershop, who would go on to accumulate a considerable amount of property in Tacoma. Nettie joined the Allen African Methodist Episcopal Church as an organist and choir director and became one of the best-known music teachers in the city. She presented dozens of students in piano recitals each year. Because her home was in one of the more diverse areas of Tacoma, the neighborhood we now call Hilltop, her students were of all colors and from all walks of life. In 1902, Nettie organized the Mozart Musical Club, which sought to broaden students' knowledge of music history. This was especially important in an era before Tacoma's schools offered music. Today, Nettie Asbury is rightfully recognized as a champion of social justice. In 1913, she founded the Tacoma chapter of the NAACP, the first chapter west of the Rockies. Always attentive to injustice, she led efforts protesting laws against interracial marriage, the establishment of segregation at Fort Lewis, race-based seating restrictions in Tacoma's theaters, and the showing of the controversial 1915 film Birth of a Nation. She was also responsible for Tacoma visits by a number of prominent African-American leaders and musicians. Providing the soundtrack to this life spent in service to community and social justice was Nettie's piano, which she played every day and shared with her hundreds of students. At the age of 79, Nettie joined the Baha'i Faith. 
Through this faith, she pursued, quote, harmony between the races and implemented the principles of music, quote, the beauty of form, harmony, and expression of emotion to bring people together. Nettie Asbury died November 17, 1968, at 103 years of age. She donated her piano and library of music to the Tacoma Association of Colored Women's Clubs, which created in her honor the Asbury Cultural Club. This club is still in existence and promotes black history in the schools and in the community. On September 27, 1914, Nettie Asbury was among the musicians who presented a program given in Tacoma under the auspices of the NAACP. The event was a memorial for the British composer Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who had recently passed away at the young age of 37. Why would a British musician be honored in Tacoma? Because that musician was a hero to many African Americans who were engaged in the fight for equality. By proudly weaving African and African American themes into his classical compositions, as white composers had done for centuries with the folk songs from their cultures, Coleridge Taylor earned the respect and admiration of black Americans. Although British, the composer had been invited as a guest to the White House, a rare honor in that era for a person of African descent. He toured the United States several times and befriended significant black intellectuals and artists. On that day in 1914, when his life was honored in Tacoma, Nettie Asbury accompanied for the choirs that gathered from multiple black churches. She also played a composition by Coleridge Taylor for solo piano, titled Pilgrim's Song. The music is based on a Negro spiritual melody. While we don't have a recording of that event from more than a century ago, we can at least experience the music Nettie played that day.
Also performing on that day in 1914 was a musician by the name of Frank D. Waldron, who would go on to become one of the most influential musicians and teachers in Seattle's early jazz scene. But before settling in Seattle, he spent a few years living and working in Tacoma. Frank Waldron was born in 1890 in San Francisco, where he likely pursued his early musical training. According to census records, he and his family moved frequently up and down the West Coast, including some time spent in Canada. As a young man, he seems to have moved where the work brought him, and that work was jazz. Waldron played both trumpet and saxophone, as well as arranging and composing original music. Waldron does appear in the Tacoma City Directory in 1914, when he participated in that concert celebrating Samuel Coleridge Taylor, and then he seems to have spent the next few years in Seattle. But by 1917, the newly established Camp Lewis was booming with construction, as well as new recruits preparing to ship off to Europe. This made for a captive audience for the hottest music of the day. Waldron performed at clubs near the base that were frequented by soldiers, alongside touring musicians from other parts of the country, such as Jelly Roll Morton. By 1918, Waldron had moved downtown, where he was working as a musician at the Olympus Hotel on Pacific Avenue. Tacoma's black newspaper, The Forum, mentioned Waldron as one of many, quote, colored musicians who would give the public their money's worth. The fact that Waldron participated in the 1914 program alongside Nettie Asbury reveals that he was not only establishing himself in the jazz community, but also in the larger black artistic community in Tacoma. In 1919, Waldron moved back to Seattle, where he performed in a variety of venues and also established his Waldron School of Trumpet and Saxophone, through which he would influence a generation of young jazz musicians. The most famous of these students was Quincy Jones, who would later say of Waldron, quote, then we finally got a trumpet teacher named Frank Waldron. He was an African-American with a bald head, and he used to wear striped pants like the guys in the English Parliament. He looked like he stepped out of the Harlem Renaissance. He had a little flask of gin, and every night he'd take a sip three or four times, and he'd said, let me hear you play something. He was from a legit school of trumpet players. Before he left Tacoma, Waldron left our city one last artifact. He self-published a piece of music titled, The Kaiser's Got the Blues Since Uncle Sam Stepped In. While the title and cover art fit into a larger theme of patriotic sheet music published during the war, this is a uniquely well-crafted piece revealing Waldron's talent as a composer, a part of his artistry he would continue to develop later in his career. Let's listen.
<laughs> how is it that, that the American Negro, who for so long has been a second-class citizen in yeah. the United States... Still is, I'm sorry. Uh, well, how, long, how is it that he's contributed so much to American <coughs> culture? Well... It's music, dance, you know, everything you can think well, of. Well, I have to be very modest about that. I would say <laughs> certainly as we look at the African peoples in Nigeria, for example, I just got a wonderful invitation to go to Nigeria to be present at the installation at the uh, at the uh, Governor General Azikwe, an old friend, mm -hmm. who will now and I uh, and I had to cable him. I'm in Australia. I certainly would like to be with you, uh, but I'm out here with some good folks. But I'll get to Nigeria later. Mr. Rapson, so, do you feel uh, that Africa is to some extent an affinity for it, a home, or do you still feel America is essentially your home? How do you feel? In, with well, let me come. Africa? Yeah, I'll come to that in just a second. But to come back to it, so I would say the Africans and the American Negroes have turned out to be an extraordinarily gifted people. The great tragedy is that by not making us full-class citizens as yet in America, they may be losing I don't know how much yet. That's all. And to come back, I would say that unquestionably, I am an American, born there, uh, my father slave there. Upon the backs of my people was developed the primary wealth of America, mm. the primary wealth. You have to have accumulated wealth to start, you know, to build. Mm. You did it another way here in Australia. You, you know, you had to build your accumulated wealth too. Mm. You just came and took it, you know what I mean? And that's what they did in most of the countries. <laughs> it's what you West, that's what you Europeans did. You just took it. We got to catch up with you a little bit. <laughs> and so in America. So there's a lot of America that belongs to me yet, you understand? Mm. But just like a Scottish American is proud of being from Scotland, mm. I'm proud for being African. Now in our school books, they tried to tell me that all Africans were savages. Till I got to London and found most of the Africans I knew in, were going to Oxford and Cambridge <laughs> and doing very well and, uh, and learned their culture. Yeah. Uh, and even once had, well, somebody had the temerity after one had, had t conquered the Chinese people and imposed upon them the opium trade and everything else to suggest that they were a backward people, just the people who had been civilized so long over the rest of you folks didn't make any sense at all. So somewhere uh, it was wonderful to find about the colored peoples of the world that they were very advanced. So I would say today that I'm an American who is infinitely prouder to be of African descent, no question about it, no question about it. I'm an Afro-American, and I don't use the word American ever loosely again. Now this was, the feeling, right. this was the feeling uh, That's right. that, that when you, you were in London about 19, say, 37, 38, you really had the world at your feet then. I mean, you were a tremendous success, you were recognized over the world, and yet you went back to America. Was this, right. this was the feeling that took you back. I it? felt I had to go back to my people. That's right. The, go, the going was tough. Mm -hmm. And uh, today I can go back. I just had my passport renewed. I could go back to pretty tough times now. Mm -hmm. But any time I could get a telegram next week that the Negro people had gathered somewhere in one of their conferences as they could mm -hmm. and say, Paul, in the, dif in the difficulties that are going on in America, would you come back and help us? I would take the plane as soon as I finished my engagements. For anyone alive today who remembers Paul Robeson during his lifetime, it was likely during this phase of his career, when he was an outspoken advocate for civil rights. But in fact, his life's work was so rich and complex, his true impact was not recognized until after his death in 1976. Robeson was born in 1898 in Princeton, New Jersey. His father had been born into slavery, while his mother was a member of a prominent Quaker family of mixed ancestry. In high school, Paul sang in the chorus, acted on the stage, and excelled in several sports before graduating as valedictorian of his class. As only the third African-American student to be admitted to Rutgers University, he would be recognized during his time there as a football All-American, a fine stage actor, a singer, and he was elected class valedictorian upon his graduation in 1919. Robeson went on to complete his law degree at Columbia University. He then pursued a career on both the theater and concert stages, receiving acclaim from everything from his performances of Shakespeare in London and New York to his recitals featuring African-American spirituals. As he grew older, Robeson would become ever more involved in political and civil rights issues both in the United States and abroad. The event that brought Robeson to Tacoma for the first time was the first concert of the Temple Theater's 1941-42 All-Star Series. The program included Ballad for Americans, a patriotic cantata written in 1939 for the Federal Theater Project. The lyrics take the listener through major events in American history, 
painting a rosy and inclusive picture with many references to the diversity of the American population. Robeson made the work famous through live radio broadcasts and a best-selling 1940 recording, and then went on to perform the popular work frequently on radio and in concert venues around the country during the war years. It was therefore not surprising that Robeson might appear in Tacoma to perform this piece. What was unusual, though, was the choir selected to accompany him in the performance. As a world-class artist, Robeson typically performed with professional musicians, but in the case of his Tacoma visit, he was accompanied by the Lincoln High School Choir. It was no coincidence that Lincoln would be the first high school choir to perform with Robeson. The school boasted a nationally recognized choral program under the direction of a teacher, Margaret Goheen, who spent her entire career at the school from the late 1920s through her retirement in 1955. In addition to relishing the opportunity for her students to perform with a skilled professional, Goheen was proud to introduce her nearly all-white students to a fine African-American artist such as Robeson. Her interest in utilizing music to introduce her students to diversity was also evidenced by the choir's performances for Tacoma's USO No. 2, the USO Club for Soldiers of Color during the World War II years, when the military was still segregated. And so the concert date was set. Especially talented Lincoln Choir alumni still living in Tacoma were invited back to participate in the event. Girls in the choir contributed toward the purchase of 180 yards of pink taffeta and patterns for new formal dresses to be worn during the concert, and made those dresses themselves under the supervision of Lincoln's sewing instructor. The choir received the sheet music just a few weeks before the performance, and Goheen drilled her students repeatedly to ensure perfection. Alumni who recalled the event decades later described those intense rehearsals, as well as the pride they felt when they had the opportunity to meet Robeson, who was generous in his praise of their work. He said, quote, Among all the choirs who have helped with this piece, including some of the finest college choirs, this is the easiest group with which I have ever sung. Those boys and girls and their conductor know what it's all about. Although we do not have a recording of the event, we do have this photograph, taken backstage at the Temple Theater before the performance and signed by Robeson. The intensity of concentration on the face of everyone involved captures a wonderful musical moment. Robeson's inscription reads, To Lincoln High School Choir, it was a great rehearsal and you were really swell, no joking, really fine. Congratulations. Paul Robeson, November 19th, 1941. Nation's most impressive Easter demonstration. 75,000 mass before Lincoln Memorial to hear Marian Anderson, colored contralto, make her capital debut at the Great Emancipator Shrine. Refusal of the DAR to let her use their hall fanned a countrywide controversy with this great gathering as the climax. The singer was invited by Secretary of the Interior, Ickes, who attends with Secretary of the Treasury, Morgenthau. Spectators include Supreme Court Justice Black, New York Senator Robert Wagner, and a host of notables. Here to listen to the voice acclaimed by many as the finest in a century. Marian Anderson's performance at the Lincoln Memorial in 1939 is one of the most significant examples in our nation's history of music serving the cause of civil rights. When an integrated crowd of 75,000 people gathered to hear this great singer, 
the result was a powerful statement against discrimination and segregation. Marian Anderson was born in 1897 in Philadelphia. In spite of her family's humble resources and the fact that she was refused entry to music school because of her race, Anderson relied on the support of Philadelphia's black community to pursue her study of opera. By the late 1920s and 1930s, Anderson's contralto voice had earned the respect of the classical music world, and she was performing major recitals in the United States and Europe. During a 1935 European tour, famed conductor Arturo Toscanini declared that she had a voice, quote, heard once in a hundred years. Anderson's accomplishments as a singer did not make her immune to Jim Crow laws. Although she gave approximately 70 recitals a year in the United States, Anderson was still turned away by some American hotels and restaurants. In 1939, the Daughters of the American Revolution, who owned Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C., denied permission for Anderson to perform in their venue under a white performers-only policy in effect at the time. Other possible venues in Washington also denied her permission to perform, in spite of audience demand to hear her sing. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, along with hundreds of other DAR members around the country, resigned her membership in the organization in protest. Roosevelt threw her weight behind a campaign led by the NAACP to pursue another venue for Anderson to perform, and this is what resulted in the singer's appearance at the Lincoln Memorial. Her stirring rendition of My Country, Tis of Thee is the most famous moment of this concert, experienced by tens of thousands live, as well as millions on live radio broadcast. After this major event, Anderson returned to her touring career. She appeared in Tacoma twice in the 1940s, first in March of 1941, and later in February of 1945, both at the Temple Theater. Both concerts were sold out and received glowing reviews in local papers, as Tacoma audiences flocked to hear the, quote, colored contralto who had created such a sensation in recent years. During her Tacoma performance in 1945, Anderson performed My Country Tis of Thee, just as she had to open her performance at the Lincoln Memorial six years earlier. She sang it without introduction or comment, in the midst of a program otherwise consisting of operatic repertoire. It was received by the Tacoma audience with thunderous applause. Anderson was never an outspoken civil rights activist, but by simply pursuing her artistry to the highest level and continuing to break down racial barriers for black singers in the world of opera, she played a significant role in the fight for racial equality. A key moment in her career came in 1955 when she became the first African-American to perform at the Metropolitan Opera. More than two dozen universities would present her with honorary doctorates, and in 1963, President Lyndon Johnson awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Malteris Washington was born in 1919 on a farm in Columbia, Mississippi. One of 13 siblings who formed a family choir, Washington grew up singing and couldn't remember a time when he didn't enjoy music. That said, it wasn't until he enlisted in the military that he learned to play a musical instrument. Washington joined the Army in 1941 and began learning the clarinet at the U.S. Army School of Music. He shined shoes to earn enough money to buy a saxophone as well. The tenor saxophone would become his favorite instrument. By the time he was posted to Fort Lewis in 1944, as the drum major for the 21st Army Band, he was an accomplished musician. During this time, there was increasing pressure to ensure that amenities provided to African-American soldiers on base were equivalent to those offered to white soldiers in the still-segregated military. In Tacoma, Dr. Nettie Asbury was among those leading this push for equal treatment at Fort Lewis. Dwight Eisenhower visited Fort Lewis in 1947 and recommended the expansion of the Black Non-Commissioned Officers Club. Washington organized an all-black jazz band to play in the club's new ballroom. 
When President Truman signed Executive Order 9981, desegregating the armed forces, Washington seized the opportunity to lead by example, integrating his band with the inclusion of white trumpeter Neil Friel, who was born in 1930, and was a graduate of Tacoma's Bellarmine High School. Washington also joined the formerly all-white 2nd Infantry Division Jazz Band, further integrating musical activities at Fort Lewis. After retiring from the Army in 1962, Washington chose to stay in the area settling near Fort Lewis. He formed his own jazz group, the Mel Washington Trio, and during his career he shared the stage with jazz greats such as Count Basie, Quincy Jones, and Cannonball Adderley. Described as a friendly musician who liked to make people dance, Washington was known for his kindness and generosity, qualities that helped him break down barriers of prejudice. His trio was the first African-American group to perform regularly at venues such as Tacoma's Yacht Club and Elks Club. The audience that was most important to Washington, though, was the hundreds of children he taught to play music. He worked as an administrative assistant for the Tacoma Public Schools for three decades while volunteering his time to teach music. Quote, he'd steer kids in the right direction, his son Larry said about him after his death in 2007. Quote, he was a gentle giant. He used his horn to aid the troubled dudes. As with Melteris Washington, it was military service that brought Joe Jordan to Tacoma. But as Jordan was nearly 60 when World War II began, there was never a suggestion he'd be facing combat. He was recruited for his expertise as a musician. His service to the military was to organize musical entertainment for African-American troops on still segregated bases. Joseph Zachariah Taylor, or Joe Jordan, was born in 1882 in Cincinnati, Ohio. He was a composer, arranger, and pianist who made substantial contributions to ragtime. His long and diverse musical career is full of fascinating stories. His work took him to Chicago, New York, and throughout Europe. He performed with and composed music for some of the biggest names of the early jazz era, including Louis Armstrong, Jelly Roll Morton, Fanny Bryce, Ginger Rogers, and Ethel Merman. By the 1940s, with ragtime largely out of style, Jordan found a new purpose for his musical life during wartime. After he went through officer training, Captain Joe Jordan was posted at Fort Huachuca in Arizona, and in 1944, transferred to Fort Lewis. His work included composing and arranging music, organizing and conducting bands, and programming shows. Although Jordan had already seen much of the world by this point in his life, when he first saw Mount Rainier, he said, I'm not going back to New York. He would settle in Tacoma for the remainder of his life. As a young man, Jordan often couldn't enter the venues where his music was being performed. He found the post-war Pacific Northwest much more welcoming. In 1947, he became the first African-American to be bonded as a real estate agent in Tacoma. In 1950, he was the first African-American to serve in the state attorney general's office. His drive to compose music, however, never waned. Having no previous connection to Lincoln High School, he decided in 1949 to write Dear Lincoln, a new school song. All proceeds from selling copies of the sheet music were donated by Jordan to purchase a new piano for the school's music program. He wrote, Go Giants Go, when the Tacoma Giants began their first season of baseball in Tacoma in 1960. Baseball time is here once more again. Go and see our Giants score again. Go on, hit the ball out in the field. Watch those Giants and the 
the faces they steal. We hope the panic is inside again. Giants cry with all your might again. Go, go, giants, and win the day. We're with you, giants, all the way. One Hundred Years of Progress was his musical contribution to Tacoma's centennial celebrations in 1969. One hundred years of progress, one hundred years of success. One hundred years of sweat and toil With ups and downs and strain and stress We have watched Tacoma grow Into a city proud One hundred years of progress Come on and shout it good and loud We have watched Tacoma grow and we can't help but know the progress it has made. With the industry we now abound, a mighty port on Puget Sound. One hundred years of progress, one hundred years of success, one hundred years of sweat and toil, one hundred years of great progress. On Jordan's 87th birthday, he was honored by the city of Tacoma for his many contributions. Late in his life, Jordan enjoyed a renewed interest in his work as a ragtime composer. In 1962, local Tacoma Press eagerly covered his trip to the East Coast to record a new album of ragtime with two other musicians of the era, Charlie Thompson and Yubi Blake. He also had the opportunity to mentor a Tacoma pianist, Lois Delano, who released a recording of his works in 1968. The album received positive reviews from critics at a time when scholars, composers, and performers alike were exploring and celebrating the history of ragtime. Jordan died in Tacoma on September 11, 1971, leaving behind a substantial legacy of musical contributions and having impacted many lives in his adopted hometown. I've been playing ragtime since 1900. I've wrote several songs for shows and actors. I wrote the Lovey Joe, the song that put Fanny Bryce on the map. They still play my teasing rag. And I have a lot of other tunes that probably you haven't heard, or I would like to bring you up to date on them. I am Joe Jordan. song that made Fanny Bryce famous. And, uh, but first I think I'll play for you my teasing rag. 
in its entirety. It is really a song. I wrote it in 1906. And uh, E.B. Marx published it. And uh, he had quite a few numbers. He was a wonderful trumpet player. I think his name was Rocco out of New Orleans. So he lifted a part of my tease and rag and a part of Rocco's song, and he called it Dixieland One Step. And I know you've heard the Dixieland One Step because it's been popular all through the years and very popular today. And I want you to see when the, we get to the chorus how the tease and rag was lifted out and lost its identity because the tune was called Dixieland One Step. <clears throat> That tease and rag, it is a daisy, it's got everybody crazy. I bet that you never will feel lazy when you hear that tease and rag. It's full of life from start to finish, minor and diminish. I bet that I can see your finish when you hear that tease and rag. Oh, how sweet that music sounds. It's so entrancing when you're dancing. That teasing rag the say it's fearful, but it makes you feel so cheerful. You lose your home if you're not careful when you hear that teasing rag. Oh, the teasing rag, oh, the teasing rag, oh, the rag makes you feel like dancing all the time. When you hear the band, when the music grand, you find yourself a falling right in line. You two stepping up and down.